Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. How prevalent is sexual violence in conflict zones? What is one UN agency, among several probably, doing to help reduce these, the conflict? My guest today is an expert on this particular issue. My guest today is Ms. Pramila Patton. Ms. Pramila Patton of Mauritius is the United Nations Special Representative of the Secretary General on Sexual Violence in Conflict. Ms. Patton, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you and good afternoon. I appreciate you being with me today. Thank you so much. Sexual violence and conflict. This is, we, we see there are many areas around the world and we're gonna get into that in a few moments and talk about it. But what is your office? What's the main mission of your office? Uh, when was it formed? Why was it formed? Well, thank you for this question. Uh, my office is relatively new. Uh, it was established in 2009 through a resolution of the Security Council Resolution 1888, adopted on the 30th of September 2009, as a result of a realization that despite uh, condemnation of this crime uh, and the call to all parties to conflict to seize uh, this practice of sexual violence against uh, women and children, but also uh, men, uh, that in many parts of the world, sexual violence was becoming more widespread and in many cases systematic. There was also a concern expressed by the Security Council that uh, perpetrators of this crime was rarely being punished. So through Resolution 1888, the Security Council called on the Secretary General to appoint a special representative to uh, provide strategic and coherent leadership on this question, to be uh, the spokesperson of the United Nations on this question, to engage with governments, uh, including its uh, judicial and security sector representatives, to engage with all parties uh, to conflict, that includes state and non-state uh, actors, state and non-state armed groups, but also to engage with a range of stakeholders, uh, including the United Nations system, uh, through UN action against sexual violence in, in conflict, which uh, comprise of 14 UN entities, ensuring that there is more coordination, that there is more cooperation amongst the UN entities, and to get the United Nations system to deliver as, as one but also to engage with a broader range of stakeholders, such as uh, civil society, amongst, amongst others. The Office uh, of the Special Representative was created in 2010, with Margaret Wallstrom uh, from mm -hmm. Sweden as the first special representative appointed. In 2012, the second special representative, uh, Mrs. Zainab Bangura, from Sierra Leone, she was appointed. And I was appointed last year, and I took office in June 2017. Mm -hmm. And both of the ladies you mentioned have been on our program before, so that's very good. And our viewers can go to your website, www.un.org, Sexual Violence and Conflict, to get more information about what we're going to be talking about today and some of the things we won't get to in all probability. Let's uh, look at the world, the world's large place, 7.4 billion people right now. Uh, do we have an idea of how many areas, conflict zones, where there's sexual violence? I've, I, I would guess probably wherever there's violence, there's some type of sexual conflict or in conflict zones, there's sexual uh, activities taking place or illicit, illicit illegal activities. Is that correct? And do we have an idea of how many there are around the world today, just roughly? Well, my office covers uh, 19 uh, priority countries. Mm -hmm. If you look at the report of 2017, uh, the report covered 19 countries of concern. These are the priority countries uh, with uh, uh, whose government I engage. And I have like six, seven situations of concern, such as Sri Lanka, Guatemala, where I, I, I'm like keeping watch over these, these countries. What is... Uh, uh, also important to understand is that I have a Security Council mandate. It's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a fairly narrow because conflict-related sexual violence, for me to engage with a government, uh, that government, that country must be in armed conflict. Uh, so there are issues around definition of armed uh, conflict. Then the conflict nexus must be established. Uh, it's also, I also uh, only cover sexual violence being perpetrated by state or non state armed groups so that I do not cover uh, sexual violence being perpetrated by civilians, for, for example. Uh, 
since I took office last year, I have been on a number of field missions. I think it's very important to uh, to go uh, and engage with the, with the government, but also to, to meet with survivors. So for example, since last June, I have been to uh, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. I have been to Nigeria, where I met with the Chibok girls in Abuja. But also, I also met with the others <coughs> who have been released from the captivity of Boko Haram. I have been in Sudan, Darfur, in South Sudan. I've been in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I've been to Myanmar. I've been to Cox's Bazaar to, to meet with the Rohingya refugees. Uh, and in, in fact, it's my uh, exchange, my meeting with the survivors that really drive my strategies for the mandate and my interventions, because I, uh, I have to, uh, to, to, to meet with survivors, to understand their, their experiences and their, and their needs. Mm -hmm. We're going to be talking about some of the places you've visited. And when you were going through that list, I was thinking those are very, very volatile areas. Those are extremely dangerous areas, and there, there is a lot of violence taking place in those particular areas. So it, obviously, there's a great need for your services. I know on your website you have three areas of priorities. Uh, what are those three areas of priorities? Right. When I took office last year, I... Uh, I set my own strategic priorities for the mandate because uh, over the past eight, nine years, it's true that the mandate has done a, s a great job in terms of the advocacy around this subject. Today's sexual violence in conflict is very high on the international agenda. So I had to move beyond the advocacy uh, work. Uh, and for me, uh, it's critical uh, that we uh, reverse the culture of impunity into a culture of prevention and deterrence through justice and accountability, that's one. Secondly, sexual violence does not happen in a vacuum. It, uh, uh, it happens in times of peace and it gets exacerbated in times of conflict and post-conflict. So it's critical that we address the root cause of the sexual violence with gender inequality, discrimination, poverty, and marginalization being the invisible driver of this sexual violence. Thirdly, uh, for me, the face of the mandate is that of a survivor. I think it was a mandate that was established for the victims, for the survivors. And it is therefore critical that I, that, uh, I have a survivor-centered approach, a very holistic survivor-centered approach. So these are the three uh, strategic priorities that I have set. And uh, how do I achieve uh, these uh, uh, priorities. Firstly, uh, like the implementing arm of my office, I have a team of experts on the rule of law and sexual violence located in my office, comprising of experts from the uh, Department of Peacekeeping Operations, from the Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights, from UNDP. Uh, this pool of experts, they are supported by a roster of uh, a range of experts in, in very different fields. And basically, they engage with the government. The way the office works is that I, I uh, uh, try to secure the political engagement with the government of these priority countries that I cover. And the government signs uh, an agreement, which we call a joint communique, or sometimes a framework of cooperation with the United Nations, represented by the special representative of the Secretary General. And uh, based on the needs of that government, an implement implementation plan is drawn up. And my team of experts walks in and they support the government. And basically the work that they do revolves around supporting the gov government in having a proper legislative framework in place to be able to address and prevent conflict-related sexual violence, working with uh, the justice sector to, uh, to strengthen the rule of law and ensure accountability for such violations, uh, working with the security sector, such as uh, working on code of conduct for the uh, armed forces and the police, ensuring that there are clear command uh, orders through chains of uh, chains of command, uh, with uh, time-bound targets to to uh, bring perpetrators to uh, to justice, uh, working around issues of access to uh, to justice for the survivors of sexual violence, uh, mm -hmm. looking at at. at legal uh, framework to ensure victim and witness protection. So they have been, f 
in all the priority countries uh, on which I'm working, the team of experts has been providing this kind of technical support, ensuring that uh, countries are better equipped to document cases of sexual violence, to investigate, to prosecute, uh, ensuring uh, that there is a transitional justice mechanism uh, strategy in place, a reparations uh, strategy uh, in place. That's one implementing arm. And the second one is the work that I do for UN Action, uh, action, UN action Against Sexual Violence, which is this entity comprised of 14 UN agencies, comprising, for example, of UN Women, UNICEF, mm -hmm. uh, IOM, uh, UNFPA, OCHA, a range of, of uh, UN entities, ensuring that we deliver as one. So they are very specific projects, very much uh, targeted towards service provision for survivors that we do through those UN, UN and uh, uh, different UN entities. Mm -hmm. That is a very comprehensive overview. It shows how complex this is. It's not just a matter of establishing contact with the government and say, hey, I would like to help reduce sexual violence in this conflict. But you, it looks as though you've looked at it from A to Z, taken a very macro overview of it, looked at all the different elements, and then put together a plan, a strategy to go in and talk to the government and to implement that plan so that you can help bring a change in that particular country. It was very, very comprehensive. And you mentioned the UN agencies, uh, the UN Population Fund, UNICEF, the UN Children's Fund, uh, the OCHA, the Office for the Coordination of Human Affair, Humanitarian Affairs. Those are all cre key agencies of the UN system. Do you have a task force? Do you, or do you meet sort of an ad hoc situation? When you, are they all involved in virtually every area where you go in with a plan? So each one of these 14 UN agencies, they have a focal point, uh, and I have a UN, a UN action coordinator mm -hmm. located in my office uh, that does the coordination with the 14 UN entities. Just to give you a concrete example, we increasingly s see the uh, trend uh, between sexual violence uh, and trafficking, the, the, the nexus between trafficking, uh, terrorism, and sexual violence happening in conflict. So then UN Action will actually be very proactive in engaging with the organization on, on migration, for example, to address this, this trafficking dimension. My office has brought the spotlight on uh, uh, one group that has remained very invisible, children born of rape. And uh, we are working uh, through UN Action, we are working very closely with UNICEF. Uh, in having uh, programs and, 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 and uh, support mm -hmm. services for the children born, uh, born of rape. Uh, and it's, uh, for me, uh, we are after all talking about a crime which has been the m one of history's most silenced mm -hmm. crime. And, and I think for too long, uh, uh, it has been perceived as uh, just one of those things that happens in mm -hmm. times of conflict, uh, that it's inevitable, it's an inevitable byproduct of, of war, uh, and too bad. It's just mm -hmm. one of those things that happens. And I think with Resolution 1888, we got this very, very important paradigm shift, because for the first time, sexual violence is seen as a security issue, as a threat to peace and security mm -hmm. that requires both a security response as well as an operational response. And that, that is the turning point, uh, uh, Resolution 1888 adopted in 2009. So that now uh, sexual violence is, uh, is uh, seen to be, uh, to be <laughs> preventable and it's a crime. It's, a, it's, a, it's one of the most serious violations of international human, uh, humanitarian law and human rights law that really needs to be, to be punished. And that's why I think that consist it's only through consistent and rigorous prosecution and conviction of perpetrators that we will be able to send a powerful s uh, signal to perpetrators and would-be perpetrators that this crime is no longer t uh, tolerated, that it can no longer be cost-free to rape a woman or a man, a boy or a girl. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We would invite our viewers to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with any type of a media outlet, 
be it a PBS or community access television station, or perhaps an educational institution that has an intra campus television hookup, or you just have a website. You like our shows and you want to help distribute them and share them with your colleagues, friends, family, whatever it may be, please do so. Global Connections Television is provided free of charge as a public service to help us better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. Today we're talking about sexual violence in conflict zones, and my guest today is the United Nations Special Representative of the Secretary General on Sexual Violence in Conflict, and that is Ms. Pr uh, Pramila Patton. And she is an expert on this, and she's bringing us up to date on this very important topic. And I want to shift while we got the camera in place, just flash the Secretary General's 2017 report on sexual violence. And we might just mention that just to start off the second half and mention a couple of the conclusions or recommendations or highlights of it. And perhaps we've already talked about a few of them up to this point. Well, indeed, uh, what we saw, that report uh, was presented to the Security Council this year in April, but covered the period January to December 2017. Uh, and, and, and what that report, in, in terms of highlights of that report, we saw increasingly the trend, uh, how uh, with the rise or resurgence of conflict in, in, in various areas, together with the proliferation of, of arms uh, that the, these trigger sexual violence in many parts of the world. 2017 has also been marked by uh, liberation of, of territories and uh, with that the uh, release from captivity of, of many victims as we saw in, in Iraq but also uh, in Nigeria, uh, women released from, from Boko Haram. Uh, and we saw how uh, victims of, of sexual violence uh, come out uh, deeply traumatized, uh, how it's marked by, by it's a crime that is, uh, uh, on, on, on which the society condemns more the victim than the perpetrator, and that the stigma is, is intense. Uh, very often we see that the fear of rape is, is very soon followed by fear of rejection. I have been to uh, Maiduguri, Northeast Nigeria, where I met those young girls with their babies born of rape, who shared with me how uh, they have been rejected not only by their families and the communities, but even by the internally displaced persons in the camp where they were living and how they, they continued to be harassed and abused uh, mm -hmm. uh, for having been associated with Boko Haram and for uh, having babies uh, born from, from uh, these um, uh, te this terrorist organization. Similarly, uh, I met with uh, women uh, uh, who shared in Iraq, in Mosul, who shared with me the pain and agony of having had to abandon their children born of rape during the times that they had been sexual sexual slaves. So th this, this dimension of sexual violence as a tactic of terrorism uh, is very much captured in the 2017 report. We also brought, uh, brought out how uh, difficult it's, it is becoming for uh, women's human rights defenders to do their work, uh, with uh, human rights defenders being, being threatened of rape, uh, with witnesses being, being intimidated, harassed for giving evidence in, in court. So these are very uh, concerning trends for, for us. The, the trafficking nexus, uh, uh, sexual violence, uh, uh, conflict, and, and that, that's also a very disturbing trend. And, and we also see how uh, sexual violence is being used to trigger uh, d displacement and, and, and to appropriate resor natural resources. For example, in, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, we've uh, uh, very, very unstable political uh, uh, environment. We've seen how uh, in the fight for natural resources, for example, there have been unprecedented uh, displacement of, popula of population and again sexual violence is used to trigger that, that displacement. And increasingly sexual violence is, is preventing uh, uh, those displaced population from returning to their places of, to their places of, of origin. Another trend that we have noticed through the reports that we have been receiving uh, for that report was uh, the targeting uh, of, for example, uh, LGBTI uh, individuals. 
so there, there are some, some very, very disturbing trends. And in that report, uh, which focus on 19 countries, we have, uh, I have recommended, and the Secretary General has actually listed 47 uh, parties, mainly non-state uh, armed groups, for, uh, for who are uh, persons and groups that are credibly suspected of having committed uh, uh, sexual violence or being involved in, in, uh, uh, in the commission of sexual violence. And that include uh, no less than seven terrorist groups, uh, including ISIL, Boko Haram, mm -hmm. uh, Al-Shabaab. And 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 uh, what also emerges from from the report is the is the importance of using uh, judicial accountability, but also sanctions uh, as 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 a tool to prevent uh, to to prevent sexual violence. I think we we are at a junction where we have to use all the diplomatic uh, tools uh, and all the tools that the Security Council has put at the disposal of this mandate. Mm -hmm. That's very important. And of course, you do have a toolbox full of different approaches to come at this. When you were describing that situation with the women who were raped, and there, there is a tremendous stigma, unfortunately, and uh, it goes back for many generations, perhaps bringing shame on a family or however it's perceived in that particular culture or subculture. But I was just curious, uh, what do you do? How do you work with them? Do you help with the, educational programs? Do you work with the families to help them perceive the situation differently, to have a different uh, uh, mindset, if you will, or opinion of what happened? Uh, do you work to try to help them get employment or all of the above or and more, I'm sure, but how do you work with that particular individual? Well, tackling stigma is a, is a critical component of, of, of the work, uh, and stigma manifests itself in, in very different ways. I mean, for example, uh, the stigma faced by uh, men and boys victims of sexual violence manifests itself differently, uh, and, and, and we need a set of responses to address uh, male victims of sexual violence. Uh, we, we see in some parts of, of the world where stigma manifests itself and can have very lethal repercussions, such as uh, honor killings, uh, such as mm -hmm. uh, uh, high rates of, of suicide or uh, sexually transmitted diseases. But rejection, uh, rejection by families and communities uh, is, is, is uh, we see this as being the most uh, uh, common one. Uh, so that's why I think the, I, I, I try to ensure that the response is, is comprehensive. It's not only first aid, uh, medical and psychosocial support, uh, but livelihood support. I'm putting a lot, of, a lot of focus on livelihood support, having met with those victims. And, uh, I, and, and they made a very strong case to show how uh, their, their physical security is very much linked to their, to their economic security. And having seen them, most of them having been rejected by their families and communities, that there will never be any healing if there is no economic empowerment. How do you build the resilience of these women if it's not through economic empowerment? So I'm placing, my office is placing a lot of focus on ensuring livelihood support. And I just, uh, I have just approved a, a project in, in South Sudan uh, where uh, for a one-stop shelter which has traditionally only provided medical, psychosocial and legal services, I'm including a component of skills building and livelihood support. Uh, but I also think that uh, reparations is critical because I have seen, for example, in the Democratic Republic of Congo where there has been an increase in the number of prosecutions and convictions, but in the absence of reparations for the victims, justice may not mean much. Uh, on the contrary, uh, in the DRC, women have shared with me how after having gone through that process uh, of going to court and having a conviction uh, without reparations, they have come out and, and they are more ostracized by the communities mm -hmm. who now know that they are victims of sexual violence and it, it has become harder. So reparation is another important component that we, uh, on which we are placing a lot of focus. Well, Ms. Pramila Patton, this is a very important topic. It's a very uh, 
really a heart-rending topic, and hopefully the media will cover more of it, and you have so much good information to get out to the public, and we all have a role to play in helping to overcome this problem, especially with the media, to help us better understand this particular problem. But I want to thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative program. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.